real old school, like. Right, on the way home from the theater, which yeah. is not something we've done in a while. No, so yeah, so this, you're, you are going to be getting the very raw, off, off the cuff uh, review of this one. So that's uh, that's something interesting. Maybe. Okay, so we met, if you, if you don't know us in person, um, we met both attending um, and being involved with the theater scene at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. Which, which sadly, the theater department's no longer there. But one of the um, things that I noticed amongst straight guys in theater <laughs> is a love of professional wrestling. That is true. There are a lot of us that have that... Uh have that as a as a fascination or as a as an right. interest. So, and it tends to be guys who are interested in sports but are also involved in the theater, which makes sense to me because professional wrestling sits at an intersection between sports and arts. Yeah. It's a very athletic competition that is also a performance in a way that professional sports aren't. Yeah. And so since we are um going to be seeing and reviewing the Iron Claw, um, we, I thought maybe we should talk about that, the theatricality of professional wrestling. All right. That's a good, that's a good jumping off point. Uh, it's something I've, I've talked a lot about. Um, I, I used it as an example a lot when I was teaching intro to theater. Uh, for one of my college classes, I actually wrote a paper on uh, comparing professional wrestling to the Italian Renaissance art form Commedia dell'arte okay. which if you if you're not familiar with that it is it was a form of street performance where uh, a stock cast would travel from place to place they would all play stock characters we characters that were easily recognizable that everybody kind of understood you know the old miser the goofy doctor, the cowardly soldier, and so on. Uh, they had specific masks and costumes that would identify them as such, and they would perform these street plays right. filled with a lot of slapstick, a lot of prearranged uh, bits, what, what wrestlers might call spots, hmm. you know. So, one of the things, now, you're an you are a wrestling fan from childhood. Yeah. Way I the way I mark the date is I'm a wrestling fan from about WrestleMania six and seven on. Which was early eighties? That was yes, early eighties or right at the nineties. I can't remember exactly when it hit, but yeah, it was in that um it was in that kind of transition from the eighties to the nineties. And I my dad was a big wrestling fan, my dad and brother. Um, and so I was subjected to it a lot <laughs> as a child growing up. Um, they would do, they would, they went to a couple of the big names back in the day with WWF. Yeah. Um, wrestling matches, but also they went to several of the, uh, district, regional type of, what would you, what do you call them? Independent. Like the independent. I used to go to those, um, in Memphis when right. I lived there. A buddy of mine was actually a, a wrestler. And so I used to go to a lot of the independent shows. They were a lot of fun. Right. They were, well, they, that's where um, my dad and brother, when my dad, back in the 90s when he was still wrestling independently, like there's a picture of my uh, dad, uh, my brother with Double J Jeff Jarrett when wow. he was wrestling in the independent circuit. Wow. So that's a, that's an old. That is a while back. So, uh, but then, you know, once I moved on, I wasn't really into sports. I didn't really watch. But since you've moved in <laughs> a year ago, um, we, like, began cohabitating. And I started watching wrestling with you. Uh -huh. And uh, we, like, I've become a fan of it. Um, both as a societal uh, commentary, but also as a theatrical performance. Like, I think there's a lot of chess that goes on in the wrestling world, I yeah. think. So, um, okay, so what you said about the characters in Commedia de Arte is something that is noticeable in the wrestling world. Yeah. So, things like, one thing we've talked about is, if you're an older bad guy, you wrestle with your shirt off. <laughs> Bye. 
Uh, what are some other things that you would Well, I say? mean, uh, that, that is true, but, I mean, you look at... Th there are certain archetypes that have been around since I've been watching and have been around even before um, I started watching. You know, the, the, the snooty aristocrat, the evil rich guy. Right. Um, there is always the, the, the crazy brawler, you know, your, your, uh, your Mick Foley's and your Brody Lee's and your, you know. I would put Darby Allen in that camp yeah. now. Um, yeah. There's, um. Just willing to com do something completely crazy yeah. and off the wall, like jump off of a, you know, cage. You know, the one that, the one that I, I, I don't know why we still go to it. Actually, I do because we've become like Xenophobic, but the evil foreigner oh, yeah. has always been a uh, well. For instance, the guy we're gonna go see the Iron Claw, and the 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 patriarch of the the Von Erichs, Fritz Von Erich. Right. Um, the reason you know they call him Fritz Von Erich in the finishing movies, the Iron Claw, is because he was originally portraying a German. Right. Because it was fresh, you know, fresh off World War II, so a lot of German... It was about 20 years after World War yeah, II. Yeah, but, but still, still, that that German, yeah. you know, then you get Nikolai Volkov in, in the Iron Sheik. Yeah, I was going to say the in, Iron Sheik. In yeah. the 80s, and then you got... Sabu. Sabu, you got Yokozuna. Yeah. Who, you know, in Japan in the, in the 90s, which he was not Japanese, he was Samoan. What's <laughs> interesting to me now... Like, okay, so we have made a switch from WWE to AEW. Yeah. Like, we are solely AEW. Um, you know, Independent Circuit's not, like, t like TNA, what's the other one called? Um, Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor, Short, which is owned by, by AEW. AEW. I'd but still watch, I would still be watching Impact if it was on a channel I got. The political and social damage done, especially by Vince McMahon, but by the WWE in general, mm -hmm. it's just not something that we would associate ourselves with. Especially now, this is very topical at this moment. Uh, as Vince McMahon has had another sexual assault case brought against. Yeah, like him. as we're recording this, it literally happened like the last two days. So <laughs> we are solely AEW, and yeah. I will say that, like what you're saying about the the foreigner, as opposed to that, a lot of the bad guys here in AEW tend to be smarmy white guys. Yeah. Like Christian Cage, snooty, snobby, classist, sexist white guys. Yeah, they tried doing it early on with a with a boxer turned wrestler. I think I think Anthony Agogo, I think was his name, who was British. Mm -hmm. And they tried doing it with him and Cody Rhodes. The whole yay America. It's like, but it's hard to whip up any us against <laughs> then Ferber against the Brits. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's like really the Brits. That's who we're going after. Yeah, and we have a lot of, like, AEW does have a lot of Mexican and Japanese wrestlers, but they're never presented solely as no. the heels. There is a heel that is one of the Japanese wrestlers, but because it's more of who he's associated with, the guy who's evil, Howie Mandel, <laughs> ra rather than... Uh, because he's Japanese. Because he's Japanese. Well, I think that you can trace that back to the fact that a lot of... A lot of these guys, a lot of the guys in AEW who formed it, wrestled in Japan. Right. Or Mexico. Yeah. So, like, that was kind of the track of um, development that a lot of these guys went on. You start off in the independents, probably worked in Canada, then went either to Japan or Mexico. Right. Let the Japanese wrestlers beat the shit out of you for a couple of yeah, cause, years. Yeah, um, what's his name... Kenny Omega was a big Japanese wrestler. Yeah. And he's one of the founding members, but one of the the foundation members, Chris Jericho, he was Mexican wrestler back in the day. Yeah, he yeah, he worked in Mexico. He worked in Japan as well. Okay. So did the Young Bucks. So mm -hmm. did you know, so did a lot of these guys. They all they all kind of So I think you don't you don't see that xenophobic bent. You know what's also interesting, I think this is a really important one to mention. Um, speaking of archetypes, is that one that was around for a very long time, and you can see it the in the queer coded, the queer coded bad guy, the yeah. gorgeous George, the gold dust billion Chuck, yeah. uh, Lodi in WCW. 
Yeah, they Lenny and Lodi. That was who they were, Lenny and Lodi. So, but in uh, there yeah. are several out members of the LGBT community in AEW. Yeah, uh, Anthony Bowens. Anthony Bowens is a out gay man who was a tag team wrestler. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I, I think it says a lot of the development of the business, and also just we can you can kind of rightfully say that we as a society have not evolved as much as we should have but it's nice to see victories when they exist and when he for the first time on TV in front of an audience said I'm gay and the audience cheered him and chanted and chanted for him you know that was not a that's not something that would have happened you know well, it's not something that would have happened in AE or in WWE no certainly not I think what AEW has done is fostered a community of acceptance and inclusion mm -hmm. and being um, when you as the head of the company and as the you know founding founding members of the company when you model that and you say this is what we stand for then you get your followers your your, yeah. your fans to kind of fall into place too and I think that I think that for a sect of people who are wrestling fans who may not have access to a lot of LGBTQ acceptance or inclusion that's very important yeah and I and it is important I think you said that um, but they you also see them enforce it they don't right. it's not a thing I read a there was an article about a year ago and uh, people were criticizing them saying oh they just pull out their LGBTQ wrestlers during Pride Month it's like no no they don't they don't just do that and no, they could be acclaimed or one of the yeah. I would say one of the There's one of their top acts yeah um, but also I remember stories of uh, Nyla Rose who's a trans woman uh -huh. um, several at least twice I, I've heard stories of someone brought like uh, transphobic signs or whatever to, to one of the tapings and security confiscated the signs and removed them right so it's not just a thing that they just kind of do to make it you know oh, make themselves look we are yeah make themselves look good it's something that they are enforcing yeah so it, I, I think it's a it's more of a um, like you say it's it's a it's a culture thing they really endorse that kind of culture Right. And, you know, and I was thinking, because we, we were talking about that whole concept of the America being the good guy and whatnot, um, they don't really push that uh, as far as, like, I think back to, um, there was a show on a couple of years ago called Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling Glow yeah. on Netflix, and it talked about the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling from the 80s. Yep. Yeah. And one of their big things was the Russian, uh, <laughs> the Russian woman fighting against the American woman. And we don't, what, the, what was her name? Betsy, I, I want to say it was like Betsy Stripes or Stars or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember. But um, they don't really push the nationalist point of view for that. No, and like, like I said, I think I, they tried once. I'm not going to, I don't want to come out here and say they've never done it. They, they tried once with the, the Brit versus the American thing. And, you know, Cody Rhodes was all, oh, I'm going to be the American dream tonight, you know, and all that. And it, and it, and it didn't fly. Well, like, nobody bought it. It was, a, it was a bad match. Nobody cared. And I think they kind of said, okay, we're not going to do that again. Well, and then, you know, you have so many wrestlers are Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, then, so, AEW came around to, what, 2018? 2019. So then they like, went, like, right? they were, they hit, and they weren't very far into it before. The pandemic hit. The pandemic Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I think, anyways. Uh, that's the politics side of it. The theatrical side of it is what we were talking about. So we have, you know, the heels, the, the queer coding. Um, what are some other aspects of it that relate to something like Commandia de Arte or theatrical performance? Well, 
like to say it's the uh, it's a predetermined it's an athletic competition with a predetermined outcome right or an, an athletic exhibition I think it's how legally how um, like the paperwork that they fill out when they when they rent an arena it's how they have to describe the event a uh, an, an athletic exhibition with predetermined outcome kind of like the Harlem Globetrotters oh yeah you know so obviously you know obviously it's the the big showmanship the the pyro the music the costumes the you know what gets me is how how far out they have to really plan something um this past you know six months or so i would say even longer than that they've been doing this thing to get to a heel turn which involves the champ and becoming best friends yeah. with somebody. So the, the MJF Adam Cole right. uh, and friendship. So that was like, that was a long time. Plan. Yeah, they, well, in the night, like, like I, was, I was telling you, like back in the early days, like it was a three year storyline with Adam Page becoming champion. Right. You know, so yeah, a lot. And it, what's interesting, and I don't know the ins and outs of it, obviously, but it, I'm sometimes curious as to how much of it is pre-planned and how much of it they kind of see see that it's working and then go, let's let's stick with this a while longer. See, and then, that's what's fascinating about it. It's because you have to both have the improvisational yeah. talent as well as the pre-planning. Like, you've got to be able to be good at both. Yeah. Because you also have things like Adam Cole falling off the stage and getting a foot injury yeah. and being not able to wrestle for how long. Okay, you have you know, um, and then the guy who was supposed to replace him got a concussion and yeah. they had to move on to somebody else. Like there were so there's so many little things like that that they have to account for and be able to turn at a moment's notice yeah. while still maintaining that long term effect which I think that's I think that that is a, a is fascinating the combination between the long term storyboarding and planning with the flexibility and improvisation mm -hmm. even in this in, in, uh, in a ring like you have your set outcome you have your choreographed moves but you don't know that everything's going to turn out exactly the right way yeah. you might misstep there might be sweat and you slipped on the floor there might be you know something threw a wrench in your plans and you have to change it up yep on the spot well we watched we watched the one match um it was john moxley and uh, no it was uh, his brother phoenix phoenix right here. where right there in the early goings like phoenix rammed into him and knocked moxley silly right and he ended up with the Concussion, yeah, like maybe? a fairly bad concussion too, from all accounts. And they, you could tell that they were wobbly, and um, and everybody was a little off kilter. But they, like I say, they were able to kind of course correct. Right. You know. And, um, <laughs> which was interesting because theoretically that changed the outcome of the that not only changed the outcome of that match, that changed the outcome of the title. Yeah. From that for a little while. Yeah. So. Now, because um, we're on our way to see a, a wrestling movie. Okay. Um, and it's kind of interesting to me that as a theat as theatrical as it is, there aren't a lot of movies. There's not. About wrestling. No. Like, what, there was Glow that we talked well, about. Well, that was the TV show. Right. Um, I can only think of three prior to this one. Okay. Uh, there was No Holds Barred in the 80s, which was a Hulk Hogan vehicle. Jeez. Very um, WWF at the time backed. Yeah. I mean... Uh, and you, you should call anything that's a Hulk Hogan vehicle a Hummer. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Hummer. I like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, anybody who hasn't seen that, it is a glorious piece of 80s nonsense. Yeah. It is so... It's, it is, I think I would put it in one of those so bad it's good <laughs> kind of categories. Because it is, it is atrocious, but there is something just hypnotic about it. Like the way, 
Hulk Hogan walks around in everyday life in spandex, uh -huh. and everybody just acts like it's normal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, so there was that one. Then a few years ago, there was the Mickey Rourke film, The Wrestler, oh, the wrestler yeah. which was very good. Right. Very good. Um, then um, a couple years ago, we got the the fighting with my family. Yeah, the Soraya Page biopic. And now this one, so you don't really. Was there one? I'm trying to remember if it was a boxing or a wrestling movie with um, what's her name? What's his name? Uh, the, the the British guy, very serious, and he was Batman. Christian. Christian Bale. Yeah. That was a boxing movie. No, a okay, fighter. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> never mind. But um, but it's interesting, and I. I well, there was that one about the the guy who was was Steve Carell. Uh, yeah, but that's that's more of an amateur. Yeah. Wrestling, uh, and because that you know, I I'm going to use a term that they hate because that's you know a real sport, quote unquote. Right. Um, there was actual drama and everything. The problem with wrestling movies is that up until a few years ago. They were trying to say wrestling was real. Yeah, they were trying to be very protective of the secrets of the kayfabe and trying to. So you can't really tell the drama of of someone's life and also try to make it look like this cartoony world that they live in is real. So if you're not a wrestling fan, kayfabe is like the whole background made up story kind of situation. Yeah, like when two. Okay, like a good example, like back in the 90s, they did a storyline in WWF where brothers, real-life brothers, Bret Hart and Owen Hart, were fighting. Right. And because of that, they didn't travel together, they didn't room together, right. they didn't talk to each other on the road, they had to be very careful when they had like a family function that they, nobody saw both of them there, <laughs> because they were upholding the story that... They were fighting. That they were mad at each other. And that's, right. you know, so it was this whole thing of, if you've ever seen the, the Christopher Nolan movie, The Prestige, yeah. about stage magicians and the concept of having to live a lie every time you're out in public so that it does, so that the show looks real. Right. You know, that's, that's kayfabe. To, but no, that, yeah, they don't really do that. Well, like a, a good example of that is the the fighting with my family, which is a good movie. You know, Florence Pugh does a great job. You know, it's a, it's a good film, but it really is trying to straddle that line between this is her real life and the wrestling is real. Right. You know, and it's like, but we we see that it, you know. You know I, Anyways, I think the other issue is that so much of the narrative of wrestling history is controlled by the WWE. Right. Which, okay, so we watched a documentary about Ric Flair? Uh, I, are you, I think you might be talking about the, the plane ride from hell. No. no. No, I'm talking about the one that we watched with Ric Flair where they talked about him being part of the ch t Tennessee Children's thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And then, like, his life up till now. Yeah. But it was it was produced by WWE, so it s totally skimmed over any kind of drug use, yep. steroid use. Any kind of negative. Right. You know, they don't want anything negative associated with their product, which is, again, it hinders your ability to tell stories and movies about it because a lot of bad shit happened. Now, on the other side of that, there is the Vice show, The Dark Side of the Ring. Yes. And there's a lot of people who are not associated with WWE anymore who take part in that show. Yes. And it's a documentary series. I think it's had four seasons. It's, yeah, they're getting ready for their fifth. So that is a lot more eye-opening about what actually went, especially like in the 70s, 80s, yeah. 90s, yep. what went on behind the scenes um, with wrestling. Yeah. You know, the which, you know, it shouldn't surprise that, you know, the wrestling world is kind of a mixture of the the sports world and the music world. Right. You know, and so if you've ever seen a behind-the-scenes or behind-the-music,
music or anything like that, you kind of get the idea of <laughs> where that's going to be coming from. Right. Like, there is a lot of drug use. A yeah. A lot of sleeping around. Um, strangely enough, the the one about the Von Erics, like, who we're about to go see the movie about, is not one that has a lot of the drug use. They mention it. Right. Like, they mention that, you know, drug use was... Uh, was a part of their lives, but they don't really they didn't really go into detail as to what. Right. You know, if I I would probably I would guess just because of the era, you know, obviously marijuana, cocaine, probably. I would say painkillers for a lot. Yeah. Of but um. Uh, well, and that is I think that's the that's the thing that uh, Bret Hart talked about this in his book that drug use is very very prevalent amongst wrestlers, especially of that era, because yeah, your body hurts. Right. And it starts out with he says a lot of them, it starts with you know, marijuana, you take a few hits and, you know, it helps you feel a little better. Your back doesn't hurt as much, your knee doesn't hurt, but eventually, the pain gets so big that you can't that doesn't do it, and you gradually you know, kind of move on to to harder and harder stuff until you're kind of lost. Right. So, um, so yeah, as far as pre- like documentaries for this, um, we really, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word for it, but we really uh, gotten into the Dark Side of the Ring documentaries. They, they seem to be pretty open about things that happen. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, if you're on Peacock, which is, WWE is associated with Peacock, a lot of the wrestling documentaries on there, we've tried a couple of them, and they're just so... They, they... Glossy. Yeah, some of them are really well done, and there's, like, I, I will say the ECW documentary is very good. Right, but I don't think that that one was... Done. No, it was. It was part. That was one they did and released on DVD for them. So that was that was them. Right, produced. but that wasn't done in the last couple of years. No, so that's been a while. Yeah, but um, but yeah, a lot of their stuff is very. If they like you, then they're going to gloss over a lot of your issues. If they don't like you, they're going to bury you. Another one that we watched, which was really fascinating, and it's just the weirdest rabbit hole you've ever been down. Was the Teddy Hart documentary? Oh my God! Now I think that one was on Netflix, maybe. I think so. I can't. I cannot remember. But Do you remember what it was called? Um, no. It's like something like cats and crazy or something like that. But it was. We'll have to uh, look it up and, and, and get yeah. the name of it in the in the actual review. But, yeah. Um, it is like it's this. The Hart family is. If you're not familiar with them at all. The Hart family is a huge wrestling family. State like they're situated in Alberta, Canada, um, and they have like Owen Hart, Bret Hart were big in the nineties. Yeah, that's and where, the two thousand. As were you know Jim the Anvil Neidhart, who married one of the daughters, the British Bulldog Daisy Boy Smith, who married one of the daughters. Like it is basically wrestling royalty. Yes. And there is a nephew. Teddy Hart. Yes. Who runs a amateur wrestling promotion. A school. A school. Yeah. And which consists of him making people roll him joints. Right. <laughs> like, and possibly making like custom fetish movies. Yes. It was, it, um, it, there's a lot that went on in this. We plus he breeds cats. Yes. Like, but honestly, if you ever just want to watch crazy that that is like that documentary just every episode there was something in it that was like what you Where know did it's, that come from? you know it's bad you know it's bad when wrestlers who have known a lot of crazy people say this he was one of the craziest people I've ever met right like that's that's a high bar you know it's bad when one of the least crazy things that he does is when he starts to juggle a kitten. Yeah. Okay, and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's the least crazy thing he did. So, yeah, that one, we'll get the name for you for that one, but... Uh, like, 
kind of it's a documentary that just spiral out of control, that would be one. Now, the ultimate wrestling documentary to me, and I don't think we haven't watched this one. I've watched it, but I don't know we haven't watched it together. Um, uh, wrestling with Shadows. Okay. Which was the documentary crew that followed Bret Hart around during his last couple years with the World Wrestling Federation. And they they happened to be there at the infamous infamous Montreal screw job where Vince McMahon basically s- screwed Brett out of the championship on his way out of the company. Okay. That was a huge and a lot of people have come out against it in the past couple of years, but it was one of the first documentaries that really came out and was like, this yes, this this is all fake quote unquote but it's not fake to the people who live it that's another thing that it's just like it's it's so it's like saying that theater is fake yeah okay there is a definite suspension of disbelief but the athleticism is not fake like these people work so hard yeah okay maybe the outcome is planned but they still have to be able to climb up on top of something and do a double backflip off yeah. of the and I knew people who you wouldn't think I think about Hangman and a page being like a big bulky guy and he's doing backflips yep. off of the off of the ring and you're like mm-hmm. how are you doing that? Oh yeah. So So but yeah Dark Side of the Ring is a great not Dark Side of the Ring, uh, Wrestling with Shadows is a really it, it, I, I love it, and again, I know it's come under some criticism in the past couple of years, but it it was really good. So, yeah, but if you just want to try a little snippet, I think the episodes on on Dark Side of the Ring are yeah, on Hulu. On Hulu, I think maybe thirty minutes long. Thirty to an hour, I think. Yeah, depending. and so there's several. I would say, um, which ones do you think would be the most interesting? Um, the Von Erich one, right? Definitely, uh, I definitely would look at that one. Um, they did a, an outstanding one on the death of Owen Hart. Right. There was, wasn't there one on, um, Elizabeth and... They, they did, yes, they did one on Miss Elizabeth and the Macho Man Randy Savage. Uh-huh. Um, they did a, a two-part one on the deaths of Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. Right. Which I think is one of the most interesting... I think that's uh, a real, like, takes a real look at the brain damage. Well, and, 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 and the, the, the circumstances that led into everything, not, right. like, the effect, uh, like, it's, it's, it's very telling that the documentary is about the both of them. Right. And about how the loss of one really cracked the other. Right. You know, yeah. um, but those, those are really really powerful episodes. There are other ones that are kind of fun, like the Brawl for All, talking about the boxing matches that they did. You know, So not all of them are tragic and terrible, but I mean, be prepared if you're going to watch these. These are some... These dark are, stories. These are dark. They're tragic stories in a lot of cases. The, the Von Erich one that we are about to go see, this is kind of a before and after because you know, I've been loving the things on TikTok of uh, people going in to see this, oh, we're going to go see a Zac Efron movie, and then showing them at the end just bawling uncontrollably. So, <laughs> so we'll see how we feel directly after this. What about um, the one, the guy who was a closet gay man? Who oh, uh, Chris Canyon. Chris Canyon. That yes. Was not just Chris, not just the closet gay man, but someone with uh, bipolar disorder, depression. Like, it really shows like how you sometimes wonder watching these if we had been more aware of mental health right. been more aware of warning signs and if it wasn't such a macho manly man uh, culture for such a long time like how many of these guys might still be alive right. you know if, if they had received the help that is very a lot of them are very open about now. Like I, I think of John Moxley, one of the wrestlers for AEW, who he he said, you know, I'm I'm an alcoholic and I need to go to rehab and I need to go get my head straight and you know I'm suffering from some depression and I gotta go get this fixed. 
social media or TikTok ever, we knew kind of what we were getting into. Right. We'd seen the documentary. Yeah. So we, we knew how this was going to go, you know, but the film does such a wonderful job of painting this really beautiful picture of these brothers and their love for each other and their bond that when the tragedy happens, even though you are aware it's coming, it still, it still hits, yeah. you know, and man, this one, this, this is a, oh, this, it's a heartbreaker. It is. And it's, it, it is one of those tragic stories for those who don't know. All right. Um, the Iron Claw is the story of the Von Erichs, which are a wrestling dynasty from you know, about the 70s through the 80s is when they were kind of at their peak, uh, made up of, um, in this film, uh, four, but in reality, five brothers. They, they cut one of them from the story because they felt it would be too much tragedy. Um, uh, although there are five brothers in the film. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the dynasty goes back to the 60s is with, when with their dad, Prince yeah. Von Eric yeah. uh, was wrestling. Um, but So Holt McCann McCallany, whose name, last name I can never pronounce, uh, from Mindhunter, is actually uh, played the, the patriarch Prince Von Eric and Mara, oh gosh, Mara Williams? I think. Uh, is the mom Doris. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have Zach Efron as Kevin Von Erich. Who is the the uh, protagonist of the story. Yes. Really. Um and then uh, Jeremy Allen White, Harris Matheson, and then uh, the um, the youngest brother's name I cannot remember who the actor is playing. Yeah. Um, but we have the four brothers and the family. And um let's just say it, I think this is one of those things that we should address. Um, so there's going to be some trigger warnings yes. in this review because this this film and this story deals with depression. It deals with suicide. Um, um, so those are things that drug you, use drug use that you should know going into this review and into this movie. Right. So if you know, uh, just be aware of that um, because yeah, through circumstances and tragedy all but one of these brothers uh, pass away. Right. And it is, and again, it is through increasingly tragic circumstances that right. this happens. So basically the family believes that they've been cursed. There's a curse um, that's keeping them from success, keeping them from happiness. And it's hard not to kind of agree with it <laughs> by the end of the movie, don't you think? Um, it is. It is a little bit. Um, 
Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So Zac Efron plays our our protagonist Kevin Von Erich, who is the only surviving member of the Von Erich family. Right. I think you said that already. Yeah. Okay. So let's just. I mean, let's jump into it. Let's talk story. Um, how do you feel like this was written, knowing the real story and being a writer yourself? How I like... think it was. I think it was done incredibly well. Okay. I think. Um, it, it, it was. Uh, I, I know a lot of people question the, the the deletion of one of the brothers from the story, but I I do agree that I think it would have would have been just one more punch to the gut, and I know that that must feel terrible for for, for that young fellow. But I mean, well, I I think of it this way, like. If I was to write a novel based on, let's say, my grandmother's life and everything that happened to her in her life, mm -hmm. by the end of it, people would be like, okay, like, this is not realistic. This is just too much. This yeah. Too much stuff. And I think that's kind of what the Von Erics have to deal with. Yeah. It's like, by the time you get to the end of it, like, it's not, it doesn't, even though that is reality it feels more like fiction because it's just so much, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but I but I think it would, in that respect, uh, I think, um, I like how, at least as far as I can tell from my limited capacity as a wrestling fan and historian, <laughs> um, I mean, they follow things pretty closely. Right. You know, so obviously there's some um, creative license because there has to be. Right. Um, but I think um, they follow, th they use real names, they use real titles, they don't. They use real matches. Yeah. Yeah, you see footage from, you know, NWA and SummerSlam and all sorts of stuff. So. Right, and like the, the they, a couple of times they have these graphics they put up with matches and places and dates and which, they're which, ones that actually happen. Yeah, which is a good way, I thought, a, a clever way to kind of show the passage of time and right. where we're at in time. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I also think that the film does a really good job of not necessarily villainizing anybody. I, I don't think anyone was made out to be a villain who wasn't really kind of a villain. Yes, but even then... Okay, so let, let's just be honest here. Uh, we're talking about the dad. Right. Who was a hard ass and, you know, drove his kids and stole money from them. Right. Um, and all of that. He controlled his, his son's lives. Basically. Yeah. Um, but they, they also, in other sports movies, they would go out of their way to show that this guy is the worst human being that ever walked. Right, Where, and they don't really do that here. Yeah, you see that he did the wrong things, but he loved his sons. He he wasn't trying to hurt them. No. You know. I do think there was some narcissism there. Oh, there's definitely some narcissism. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think he thought he was hurting them. Yeah, and I think that's important to show. We we talked about it in one of our other reviews um, about, uh, in the Hunger Games, about, you know, nobody is completely evil. Right. And I think a, a lesser film would have taken the easy way out and just made Fritz the the out-and-out out villain. Which, right. and again, he's not innocent. Right. You know, we're not saying, I'm not saying that he, you know, but oh, he did like nothing he wrong. Was, it's not like he was an alcoholic who beat his wife. Yeah. You know, they didn't take it too far. They took, it was a very realistic portrayal of a parent who basically drives their children to these, to these deaths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that, so then we also have, um, the fact that there's so many tragedies that happen one after another and the way that they're presented, I think you talked about this. You're not a gore guy. No. We talked about this before. No, I'm not. <laughs> and um, they really were kind of very respectful uh, of the the tragedies that happened: a motorcycle accident, death by suicide. Um, there's not like there's there's no uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Fortuitousness. Um, yeah, 
there's no gratuitousness, but there's also no, uh, it's <sighs> exploitation of the, the of tragedy. Yes. Yeah. Um, it happens, and I think it's more moving that what you're seeing is kind of the quiet aftermath. Yeah, you see the lead up and the aftermath in most of it. You don't see the the act itself. I think the the first time I really kind of lost it was just this moment, this really quiet moment at, at, at the second funeral where the mom is having trouble getting ready. And like that one, like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that yeah. my heart out. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, I think, so I guess we kind of segue into the directing and like, the, wow, really skillfully directed, very light touch. Right. There's even a, I guess, a little kind of fantasy heaven scene that I didn't mind. I, I think what that was, um, is I think that was after the death of his last brother, Carrie, I think that was what Kevin was, was hoping for, what he envisioned. Right. Because it, where it comes in the movie is after he's carried... Carrie's body into the house and is sitting with him. We see that heaven sequence and then it cuts back to him. So I think that's what he's hoping he's, yeah. or dreaming or whatever to kind of uh, and it, it, it that is a beautiful moment too. That is it a really, really is. Like you would think that it would be too cheesy and wouldn't fit into this mm -hmm. but no it's just this perfect little piece. Yeah. Um. So the directing is good. Let's talk performances. So, wow. Okay, so let's start with um, uh, Harris. Oh gosh, I'm gonna forget his name now. But the, no. David. 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 Oh. So let's talk about David first. Now, da oh Jesus. Oh, <laughs> not that I not have broke my tire. Sorry, there was a tire on the side of the road. I couldn't get out of the way of. We'll know. We'll know soon enough. Yeah. Um. So. David is the, the second, the second oldest after Kevin, I believe. Okay, and he is the first to go after the championship belt. Yeah, the first to really gain fame. Not only is he an athlete, like Kevin's a very good athlete, but David is a very good athlete, but also a very good showman. Mm. And so he's he's the golden star that you know yeah. is going to make it, and he has. Shortly after Kevin's wedding. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, kind of going back a little bit to the writing, and I mentioned this when we left the theater. Um, for non wrestling fans, I think this had one of the best pieces of writing ever to kind of explain why these got why the world championship matters, and even though the, the matches are predetermined, you know. Uh, Kevin goes out on a date with his future wife and, you know, she says, well, you know, why does being the world champion matter if it's all predetermined? And he, and he says, well, in any job, you want to get promoted. So getting a title is showing that you've done a good job and that they're promoting you. They're moving you up and getting the world title says that you, you've you done the best job and they're recognizing you. It's a reward. Right. You know, so I, I just, I just wanted to, uh, put that in here because yeah a lot of the driving force especially from Fritz is this need to have the world title in the in the family right and I think if they hadn't taken the time to kind of explain why that was so important yeah even though the match they, they don't hide that it's predetermined they show how the matches are put together right they show them backstage kind of plotting out their yeah. choreography and and whatnot. So, like, um, and that is, you know, Kevin introduces David, and David's, uh, he's, he's not necessarily as hard a worker as Kevin, but they're all so driven to kind of please their dad. Yeah. And so they all kind of get thrown into this. And then, um, you know, you have this, this tragedy with, uh, with him just as he's about to make it big. And then you've got Carrie, who is the 
that's a. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's David. David. I'm supposed to embark on his his uh, tour of Japan. He gets a ruptured intestine. Yeah. And he dies overseas. And that's our first big tragedy that we see. And then you've got Perry who steps up to take his place, who does win the match and then ends up in a motorcycle accident. And then, you know, in all of these things, you've got Kevin back in the background, you know, trying to keep everyone on track, but also waiting for his turn to come up. Yeah. Um, and then you've got, so Jeremy Allen White as Perry, how did you feel about his performance? Oh, I thought he did great. I, I, I'm just going to go across the board and say I I think this is probably the best ensemble cast yeah. that I've seen in a long time because you believe they're brothers. Right. They really did seem like brothers, didn't they? Yeah. And not just in the way they look, but the way they interacted with each other, the way they talked to one another, the way just little things in their physicality. Yeah. Like... I, especially, okay, so with Carrie, I really felt like we saw this, um, he was a little more manic and a little more, um, I don't know what the, what, like, his drive to get the title was a little more manic than his brother's. Yeah. And, like, he indulged in the drug use. I don't I don't know that Carrie, or uh, sorry, Kevin really did. It doesn't really say. Uh, but, anyways, then we come up to Brother Matthew, not Matthew, Michael. David. No, Michael? David was the first. Yeah, the yeah, first yeah I'm sorry. The, and then there's the motorcycle accident with Carrie. Carrie. And so the youngest brother, Michael, gets pulled in, even though Michael does not want to wrestle. Michael's a musician. And he's not, he's not big, he's not bulky, he's not, you know... No, he's kind of a string bean. Um, but he, you know, does what his father wants, and uh, Kevin trains him to get into the ring, and unfortunately... Like it ends up with him being injured and having to have a surgery and ending up with brain uh, damage, and then all we have left is is Kevin. And uh, I, if you really wanted to go into the, you need to watch the movie to go into the whole story because you can't go into all of the tragedies that happen. But you have, you know, you had the frantic, manic kind of drivenness that Carrie had by Jeremy Allen White and then you have Michael's kind of sweet artsy vibe that he really kind of pulled off there mm -hmm. um, and then you've got like honestly hands down star of the show and I'm not even just saying this because I love Zac Efron like and I do I I make no qualms about it I believe we've discussed this on the show before we have we have uh, I, I definitely I have to I totally love Zac um, but, uh, he, his portrayal, having watched the documentary, uh, which has a lot, like, is basically an interview with Kevin Von Erich. Yeah. And then watching his portrayal of it is just so right on. Yeah. His, like, for him being this incredibly jacked up, like... Yeah, he's I, swole. I have no idea what he did to bulk up like this for this role. But to be this big, beefy guy, but played so, like, so softly and so, like, soft-spokenly is, was just, I mean, it was exactly who Kevin Von Erich seems to be in real life. I, 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 I'm going to agree, and I, th I definitely think you you've probably heard a lot of people give Zac Efron a lot of credit and a lot of praise for this role and it is 100% deserved. It he, is. he does a magnificent job. Um, and a lot of it is not just through what he says but through his reactions. You feel this is a guy um, one of the through lines of it um, is this whole thing of his father kind of telling them, you know, don't you cry at the funeral, don't, you know, men don't cry, men don't, and 
and seeing just how hard it is for him to process his emotions, right. especially as things get worse and worse and worse. Right. And this is really, if you're looking thematically, this is really a, a, an examination of toxic masculinity. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And the, the idea that for Kevin, he he was able to survive because he finally allowed himself to feel his feelings and allowed himself to feel loss and, um, and process it and move on. Whereas, you know, something like like we were talking about earlier uh, with Carrie Von Eric, where they show that he's there, he had, he had some kind of mental health problem. Oh, absolutely! Like bipolar or manic depression or something. Right. You know, and at the, if, if nothing else, he has he had an addiction problem. Yeah. Which is a mental health issue as well. So so he but he was trying so hard to suck it up and power through and be a man and. You know, like, like, okay, a great example is that, and I didn't know this until I watched the documentary, but, um, because I watched Carrie Von Eric as the Texas Tornado in WWF at the time. I, I remember seeing him. That's how I knew the Von Erichs. Um, but I didn't know that through that whole stint, he had, he was missing a foot. Right. Um, and this really shows that the pain he had to go through, the pain he was in. To hide that foot. Yeah, to, to, and to keep doing what he was doing. Like, I cannot imagine, because this was, what, 30 years ago. They don't have the modern prosthetics. Like, no. he was on a peg leg. Yeah. Uh, he was, like, peg foot, I guess. But I just, ugh, the pain. I well, like, imagine. if, you know, that, that thing that if, we said it in the introduction, if mental health issues were as understood as they are today, maybe, maybe there could have been help for him and maybe he would have uh, he would have lived out a longer happier life I think there's a hint of his mom having some mental health issues I think, I think they do they do kind of and even, even if it wasn't mental health issues but like just the grief that she was living with yeah you know because she had you know five sons and four of them died before she did yeah But, but yeah, and I and I and I, I, I must stress again, the ensemble. The this felt like a family. Yeah, like, it really did. It so like like I said, they did such a great job that even going in knowing what's going to happen when when the tragedy hits them, you feel it and you feel that loss. Um, and the film does a goes to great pains to show the you know their heyday and how they just. They'd go just float down the river in tires and drink beer and, right. you know, just, and they were always supportive of one another. Even when they were having fights or disagreements, they, they patched them up almost immediately. Right. You know, and, and fought through for each other. So they felt like a family. Right. I also have to give huge credit to a lot of the guys in there, uh, playing like actual wrestlers, like hard. <laughs> Bruiser Brody. Bruiser Brody, Ric Flair, Harley Race, the Freebirds. Yeah. You know, especially the guys who had to do the promos as Ric Flair or Harley Race. Really, like... Yeah, they nailed it. Yeah, they did a great job. It was... it was, um, And I think I think this is... We can, we can point this to, and we didn't realize this... Right. Until the end, and we saw the end credits. I think because this was produced by, by a wrestler. Yeah, Maxwell J. Friedman. MJF, who has a very brief cameo right. in the film. They don't even call him by name. No. But he but he produced it. So I think because of that, because you actually had a wrestler. A wrestler who is, you know, not just like he who was invested in the history of wrestling. Yeah, I think because of that, I think there was a lot of detail paid to those those details, making sure things lined up, making sure they had the right looking titles, making sure that you know, it wasn't just kind of a... That was the, the title cards, the, the graphics they used. Yeah. What did you think about those? I loved them! They were very um, nostalgic. 
Jack. Yeah. Right. I, I loved it. Um, but yeah, this, uh, I gotta say, my, my favorite scene, I'm gonna ask you a question here, um, is, and you, you probably, you, you may have seen it on TikTok, is when they're at the wedding and the brothers and Pam, Ke uh, Kevin's wife, are all dancing to uh, thank God I'm a country boy. Yeah. It was, it was just such a, that, again, that looks like a fucking family. Yeah. That's not people. That didn't look like people acting. You felt like you were at a real wedding, and this is what they were doing. Yeah, any of the scenes where they were together, and kind of like how, you know, they really did kind of welcome Pam in as a as a sister, mm -hmm. and, you know, and they were supportive. They were supportive of Michael playing music. They were yeah. supportive of, you know, they were just there for each other. And that that great scene where they they sneak. Sneak him out of the house so yeah, they so he can so go he'll play in his band. And they and Pam steal the truck and all that. It's like that that was a family. Yeah, it was very it was very wholesome and heartbreaking. Yeah. So on that, before we get to final grades up, so what part of this movie did you cry at the most, do you think? What really what part really got you the because there was a lot. I I I uh The heaven sequence is when I I got hit the most. That was, I think, like I think that's when I was crying the hardest. That was beautiful. Um, and then the last bit where he's talking to his brothers and he said, you know, and I've, I I knew it was coming because I've seen it on TikTok. Yeah. And he says, I used to be a brother, but I'm not a brother anymore. And oh gosh, I'm gonna start crying again thinking about it. Yeah, I was talking to his sons. Yeah. Like I knew he was, I knew he was gonna say it because I was seeing people sobbing about it online, yeah. and it still hit me. But that, uh, see, I I cried at that scene, but like I said, for me, it was the, the 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 part in that scene where he's crying and his son's asking you why why are you crying, Daddy? And he says, you know, I'm not a brother anymore. He says, you shouldn't see me like this. A man isn't supposed to cry. And they and his sons go. We cry, we cry all the time. It's okay to cry. That's and and he breaks down even more. Yeah. Again, kind of that theme of accepting your feelings and and feel and it's okay for a man to do that. Yeah. It makes you healthier. It makes you stronger, not weaker. And I, yeah, that's when it really got me. Is that 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 moment? I thought, and I just loved because that guy brought me in barefoot through the whole thing because that was. Kevin on Eric's thing. Yeah. Even in the documentary, he's walking through his ranch in, or his, yeah, his ranch in, uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, barefoot. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's just, yep. you know, that's what he did. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, this. I honestly, like, if there were anything that made me think awards are bogus, it's the fact that this did not get even a mention. Yeah. Uh, you know, and okay, it's a movie about wrestling. Yeah, and Rocky was a movie about boxing. We, we gave a ton of awards to movies about elves throwing something into a volcano. Yeah. Okay? Like, can we just, ex like, embrace this idea that this was really beautifully well done? Yeah. And a great movie, like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it was worth the wait. I'm glad we were able to see it. I was worried. <laughs> I was worried it was going to take too long. It was. We were so. <laughs> it's taken us a month to watch this. Movie I know. <laughs> because it did not come close by. It was. We had to drive it over to watch it, and then every time we got a chance where we were going to go see it. There was a blizzard, <laughs> and we couldn't leave town. So, so, so yeah. it's literally a month since it came out. But but worth it. <laughs> yeah. Worth it. Okay, so let's let's wrap up. So, what is your final grade for the Iron Claw? Oh, this is an A plus. It, like I am gonna really have to do some pros and cons to determine whether this or Barbie was the was my movie of the year. Mm. So, how about you? Um, A plus for me too. I. Yeah, I can't think of anything that 
that could that they could have done better. I can't think of anything that um, it, it gives you the feels. It gives you the feels. And I think it had, weirdly enough, just the right amount of heartbreak. In it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I think that it ended where it did because you needed to have that hope. Yeah. Well, I like that they, they took great pains to, to tell you in the, the end title cards, like all you know movies based on true stories, that Kevin is alive, he and Pam, his wife, are still married, and they they achieved his dream of owning a big ranch where all the family lives. Yeah, his whole family lives with him. Yeah, like it says all, all four, of four, his, kids. four of his kids and 13 grandchildren. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's so happiness came out of tragedy right you know so yeah this was this was beautiful okay but uh we did kind of a double feature Un unplanned right unscheduled so we are going to come back here in just a minute uh a minute for us a week for you all <laughs> and talk about this other really great movie that uh we went and saw tonight <laughs> so uh thank you for that thank you for coming and seeing a tear-jerking wrestling movie sure thing, Toby. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, have a good time. And as always, drive safe. And we'll see you at the movies.